good afternoon good afternoon and welcome everybody we shall start with an introduction to the earth journalism network by our global director james fan james thank you joy deep and thank you all very much for joining us here today actually this is a this is uh this panel discussion is an event sponsored by the climate change media partnership uh we're really proud of the panel that we're able to put on for you on um, shining a light on the path to net zero uh we and our colleagues have been doing a lot of reporting on on a just transition on pathways to net zero on renewable energy reporting in general and i think we've got a lot of lessons to learn and to share here so if you're not familiar with the climate change media partnership we've been bringing journalist fellows to the climate cops for the last 20 uh 15 years and we're really pleased to be able to bring 20 journalists here this year again uh we are a partnership between internews's earth journalism network which is a global community of over 25,000 journalists dedicated to improving coverage of climate change and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security uh which uh we've been working together now for 6 or 7 years to support the CCMP as we call it and um I just want to say be first of all thank you very much to the folks at SE of uh, SE for all and and the pavilion for hosting us but a special thanks to the Stanley Center for all your work together over the years These partnerships are never easy but actually you guys make it really easy so thank you very much. I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Joy Deep to introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you James. Yeah, in fact Stanley Center has become such a good partner that I don't even remember that they are a different organization. is <laughs> apologies for not mentioning you earlier but i just think of you as part of the family <laughs> that's what it is right uh, let's start um, so as you can see in front of you we are going to talk all of our panelists are going to discuss doing media reports on the energy transition hmm So without further ado I'm going to request each of our panelists one by one to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what exactly they they do and share their country perspectives we have panelists from four different countries they will tell you where they are from and provide examples of reporting that they have done on this topic start at the end is one over to you i hope this is working uh, hello everyone i'm istvan dek i'm from uh, romania reporting on uh, climate issues and uh, energy transition for the past uh, 10 years since i'm coming from a country that it's uh, quite under reported in the global media eastern europe and romania i've prepared a few notes about the situation of the energy transition in uh, my country and um, i would like to say that um, <coughs> Romania is following the EU clean energy transition targets. The EU has set binding cli- climate and energy targets for 2030, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40%, increasing energy efficiency by at least 32.5%, increasing the share of renewable energy to at least 32% of EU energy use and guaranteeing at least 15% electricity interconnection levels between neighboring member states. With over 70% of re- Romania's total energy usage dependent on fossil fuels, energy transition is paramount and so is electrifying the economy. If the shifting from direct fossil fuel consumption to an electrified economy based on low carbon sources will require a major and massive electrification program. While decarbonization efforts are needed across the whole of economy, urgent attention is required in two areas: transport and water, that are critical to achieving net zero by z- by 2050 and will improve significantly challenging between 1990 and 2018 in Romania reduced its emission by 53.2 a percent leaving it only a further 3.9% reduction to meet the goals for fit for 55 in 
2030. However, as the economy continues to expand and living standards increase, there is a real threat that current emissions could increase as well, as happened between the COVID crisis 2020-2021, instead of going down. About renewable energy, Romania commits to increase the overall share of renewable energy in gross final energy consumption to 30.7% in 2030. This translates into a renewable energy share of 49.4% in electricity, 14.2% in transport and 33.09% in heating and cooling. The installed capacity of hydropower represents nearly 30% of Romania's total installed electricity generating capacity of 6 gigawatts being used currently. And now I will speak only briefly about one of my most interesting articles. Uh, a few years ago on a, a tour with uh, Clean Energy Wire, an NGO from uh, Germany, I was uh, in uh, Germany when I visited an e-highway, uh, electrified uh, highway. It was something exclusive for our readers and the first time that someone wrote about it in Romania. Uh, the e-highway technology supplies trucks with electric drives, uh, hybrid fuel cell or battery powered on heavily frequented uh, stretches of highway via an overhead cable. Highways uh, fit fitted with overhead electric wires can charge these electric trucks on the move. I think I will pass the mic to someone else. Thanks you. Thank you, Istvan. Chiamaka, uh, tell us about yourself, about Nigeria's energy transition and about the stories you have been doing, yeah? Hello everyone, my name is Chiamaka Enendu. I am a Nigerian business sustainability journalist. So I produce uh, TV content and I also write for the newspaper where I uh, cover stories that are business related but have the energy intersection. And like you know, energy um, has close relations with agriculture, health, uh, agricultural health and the like. So I do uh, all of those for uh, Daily Trust newspapers back home in Nigeria. And uh, Nigeria currently has an energy transition plan. And that plan aims to decarbonize uh, the nation's energy space by 2060 and also uh, commercialize gas up until 2030. That is barely four to three years away from now. And beyond that, we also have, uh, oh, Nigeria is largely dependent on oil. Uh, we are one of the major producers of oil in, in Africa, uh, producing over 1.8 billion barrels uh, per day and over 35 billion in our reserves. So we are uh, a country that relies majorly on oil. So when we had the introduction of the energy transition plan, of course, it came with a lot of expectations, a lot of applause from um, experts in the space. Uh, so far there has been some progress, but I'm sure we would look at the, the challenges that are hampering the progress later on. But as I speak, I will be focusing on clean cooking, which is a sector that ha I have uh, paid close attention to lately. And I did that because I had seen you know, quite a number of reports that came out uh, from the AFDB, that is the African Development Bank, and from various stakeholders that you know, highlighted the challenges that uh, cooking with biofuels or biomass uh, causes, especially amongst women and children in Nigeria. And uh, having conversations around that has brought about the national clean cooking policy, which aims to um, increase clean cooking stoves amongst Nigerian women and the plan is to have about 30 million women have access to clean stoves by 2030. Uh, later on again hopefully we will look at how that has come but that is where we are as a nation in the area of uh, transitioning uh, based on the details of the energy transition plan in Nigeria. Damn, thanks. This is, I mean, I cannot overemphasize the importance of clean cooking. And I'm so glad to hear that you have been doing stories on this. We shall discuss this in more detail. But first, let me turn to Iris. Iris, tell us, uh, we, we hear lots of things about what China is doing. Tell us what exactly China is doing and what are the stories that you've been doing on it. Can you hear me? 
Uh, thanks, Joy Dip. Uh, I'm Liu Yi, and you also can call me Iris. I'm from China. I'm a, currently I'm a freelance journalist. I call, I have three years experience covering energy transition and also climate. And I think from China, as the China's energy transition is very complex and also ambitious, uh, as the world's largest carbon emitter. In 2020, China uh, have a goal to raise the carbon peak in, in 2030 and also carb, achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And uh, currently this policy has uh, driven a large scale clean energy investment in solar and wind power investment. And uh, I think currently the non-fossil renewable energy uh, accounts for around uh, more than 17% in China's energy mix. And uh, China wants to achieve by more than 25% by 2050, uh, 2000, two, no, 2000, two, no, 2030. And uh, in the currently, I think currently, current, but, but even though China has a lot uh, of uh, investment in renewable energy, but currently the coal is still a major uh, a part of China's energy mix is around like 56%. So, as, so China's energy transition is very complex because China needs to balance between uh, energy uh, safety supply and also the low carbon economy. And uh, for me, I think I want to share a story that I did before about the uh, a solar power farm, which I think it reflects the benefits that both for both uh, energy transition, also for the economy generating by uh, renewable production. It's like uh, last year I visit a, a, a solar power farm in China's Qinghai province, which is also Chi which is also the world's biggest solar power farm. We have the seven billion seven million uh, solar panels and uh, also more than. 8,000 megawatts in installed solar uh, capacity. I think it is very interesting because uh, many years ago that solar farm is just a um, sandy desert and it has nothing. Uh, but with the building of the solar panels, the, the, the farm, the, the local land, uh, the wind speed is slowed down and the soil becomes more weight. So the grass can grow because of the installation of the solar powers. And uh, but the thing is also, you know, when the grass grows grows taller, it will influence the uh, will influence the generation or uh, capacity generation. So the farm start to working with the surrounding uh, farmers. They can ship in there. The, the, the sheep will eat the grass, so to control the height of the grass. But if I, it, for me, I think this project's doing very well, but the thing now faced, the challenge you face now is even though that province have a lot of uh, renewable capacity, the state grid infrastructure is not updated enough, which means uh, they don't have the uh, trans transmission channels to uh, supply those uh, renewable capacity to other provinces. So, yeah, I think this is quite interesting topic. It, it is very interesting. It's, it's a problem that I think many, many countries are now facing as they move very quickly through this energy transition, uh, that they're able to generate an enormous amount of renewable energy but unable to carry it from one point to another because the transmission and distribution network is simply not moved at the same pace. Let's hear from a journalist from the country in the news in this COP for all the wrong reasons. Hmm? Fermin, what's Argentina been doing? Thanks, Judith. Uh So I'm Fermin Coop. I'm the managing editor for Latin America for Dialogue Earth, which is a global news publication. I'm also a trainer here with the Earth Journalism Network and the Stanley Center. Um, I'm also doing projects on the ground in Argentina with with ECN, focusing on the on the energy transition. Uh, it's a topic that I've been following kind of when we when I started reporting on the environment over 10 years ago, um, and. 
it's quite interesting to follow. Uh, so Argentina only has 12% of renewables on its energy matrix, so non-conventional renewables, solar and, and wind. Uh, and it has 85% of its matrix depending on fossil fuels. Uh, mainly gas, we used to have more oil, but now we have more, more gas. Uh, with big plants, so mainly because Argentina has the second largest shale gas reservoir in the world and the fourth largest shale oil reservoir in the world. And which is down south in Patagonia. And there's plans ahead to export it. We liquefy natural gas facilities around the shore and to expand production, which is in fact increasing quite significantly. Yesterday, uh, at the G20 event, uh, Argentina signed a deal with Brazil to export gas from Argentina to Brazil. Uh, so it's there's constantly on, on the news. And it's, it's interesting to follow because the question that always comes to mind is whether there's a competition between fossil fuels and renewables. And it's a country that has been in an economic crisis since I have memory. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to find a way to finance uh, renewables. So the country risk in Argentina is over a thousand points. And to actually get investors coming in and put money in renewables is very tricky. The only time the country was able to do that was through a guarantee via the World Bank. Uh, and after that finished, the renewable landscape completely stopped. Uh, so the question is, how do we deal with finance? Uh, so there's a couple of answers there. One being distributed energy. Uh, so we find many examples across the country of communities that are setting up solar and wind factories on the ground. Uh, and we have actually done stories in our website and also stories around Latin America through one of the projects that we've done with, with ECN uh, uh, over the year. And also, there is uh, something interesting linking to what Iris was saying, uh, the role of China. Uh, China became uh, one of the biggest partners on, on the energy transition for Argentina and for Latin America as a region. And I got the chance to visit a project that uh, was developed a 300 megawatt solar plant that was set up at over 4,000 meters high, so really high. I, I even got seasick kind of while getting there. Uh, but it was a really nice experience. It was a, a project that turned out really well. They involved the local communities, they gave them shops, and the project was fully funded by a Chinese state bank through a, um, and the other just a really tiny part for a local bond, a green bond that the province took. And it was built uh, through a Chinese company as well, but including uh, trying to transfer technology as part of that process as well. Uh, so we see some success stories, uh, but it's challenging on a way because we see the country going in a direction that is pushing really strongly for fossil fuels. Uh, and as we heard on the news uh, lately, Argentina has a president that's a climate denier. Uh, so they dismantle almost every environmental policy they could over the year. Uh, we are still in the Paris Agreement today. <laughs> we'll see tomorrow. Uh, but um, it's it's tricky for reporters to to follow those those issues. Uh, that's why programs like the one we did with with ECN, uh, this year, providing grants and support for reporters on the ground, can really make a difference uh, because actually. For a reporter to go there and spend some time and visit an area, it's always difficult, as we know. Uh, so it's always good to follow them on the process and, and work with them on that. But I'll leave it there, Shadip. Hey, thank you for me. But I'm not going to let you go so easily. Uh, so, because you now have unique challenges in reporting on the energy transition, right? Uh, so what do you think are these challenges you're facing and you're going to face, and how do you plan to overcome them? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Radeep. So, I think we, so there's a couple of things in there to mention. Uh, I think we need more uh, capacity building among training to reporters. Uh, that's still very necessary. One of the things that we see when we look at the stories regarding the energy transition, and I think this probably is something that relates to many of us here, is that they are quite linked to the economic angle, uh, not that much to the, the environment angle. Sometimes it's a reporter that does business stories that may have or may not have a training on, on climate, that they are the ones that get picked to do these stories. Uh, and it's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm always uh, okay with that. But 
I think it's good to have a reporter that works on a climate beat uh, in, a, in a media outlet that can, that can allow to have a transversal perspective in, in a specific media outlet. Uh, so that happens through training, through capacity building in newsrooms with editors, with reporters. Uh, programs like the one we did, uh, you actually can help reporters on the ground, can definitely make a difference. And, uh, and I've, I've engaged in many trainings over the years with reporters in, in Argentina and, and they still need that. Uh, they still need more training among capacity building uh, because the, the narrative goes on the other direction. So the government is really pushing forward fossil fuels and that's not going to change. We still got three more years with this guy in power, so that's going to stay like that. So so uh, that's why we need to find a way to, to try to contest that. I mean, we, we are not activists or anything like that, but uh, if we want to find different narratives, if we want something to, if we want to produce change, if we want the audience to engage on those stories, uh, we, we got to do things a little bit differently and um, providing reported support and getting more stories there and uh, stories that have a different perspective, that really makes a difference. Thanks, Fermin. Iris, the same question goes to you. Uh, so, are there do are there I'm any sensitive. special challenges? I'm are there any special challenges reporting the energy transition in China? Okay. Uh, thanks, Joy Deep. I think for me, the first major challenge when I uh, reporting this topic is is the expertise knowledge involving in the energy transition. Because when I enter in this industry, I I have to say I know nothing about uh, energy transition. So every time when I have to write a new topic and a new article, I was really really anxious. I need to read a lot of uh, scientific papers and uh, to ask a lot of experts about you know how how those things work like what exactly is solar power and uh, what's the mechanism of carbon market and uh, what's that new policy just uh, issued by the government means. I, there's a lot of jargons involved in the whole process so I need to check a lot of uh, things that to make sure I, I don't make mistakes in reporting and uh, yeah and I want to say thanks EJM for giving me this opportunity to cover cough it's really helpful when uh, for the people who report the COP first time. And I want to say the second major challenge I faced is the, in China now is the availability of data. And uh, I remember I usually, I always spend a lot of time on finding accurate and uh, correct data and to double check again and again. Um, for example, sometimes I will write some uh, natural gas articles for uh, energy media. And I remember a couple of years ago when I still was an intern, I, that time the China's customs will release the, the data to show that uh, where does China buy those gas and oil from. Like I can easily to see uh, the country, like Russia or other, or other countries. But I remember like maybe a year or two years ago, I cannot find those data on China custom website. So they don't publish this case data anymore. So that, which means I need to find, I need to go to other uh, research organizations, website to check those data. And usually some of those organizations will have like subscription uh, fee and it's expensive. So I think that makes me, make my work more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can see lack of data is something all of us struggle with. And Chiamaka, let's talk about lack of data in doing stories on clean cooking because that's the sort of story that is so distributed all over a country and in a large country like Nigeria. Uh, to get data must be one of the challenges. What is data one of the challenges when you're doing, trying to do stories on clean cooking and what are the other challenges that you face while doing these stories? Uh, absolutely, uh, Joydeep. Uh, Access to data is definitely one of the challenges that I face as a journalist covering uh, the area of clean cooking. Uh, even from the government agencies, unfortunately, sometimes we have outdated data and we are unable to you know, pr prefer data-driven solutions. So access to data is definitely one of the challenges that we face. Aside from that, access to information is also a challenge, access uh, to information from the private sector who unfortunately sometimes are unwilling to share all the details to certain projects. They withhold certain areas and then let you know 
just some areas that they, that they want to share. So access to information is one of those. And um, even getting information from, say, uh, people in rural areas or indigenous communities, some of them have had um, unfortunate uh, circumstances or situations with p journalists in the past who come and give them promises and say, oh, we are amplifying your voice, we're sharing your stories, and we assure you that there will be solutions. But it, time goes by and they don't get any information. So when you come and you're trying to do a story, they are reluctant to share uh, information with you. So that's also one of the challenges that I face. And again, just like Femin mentioned, you know, uh, training and retraining amongst journalists is definitely very important. And not everyone really understands, you know, issues around climate and sustainability. So it's important that we continually have this training. So training is also one of those uh, areas that I believe that we should uh, pay close attention to. So those are the major challenges that I face as a journalist in Nigeria. Thanks, thanks for putting this out so cleanly and clearly and transparently because these are the challenges that we all face. But let me ask, take this question to Istvan. Do you also face a huge challenge? Is, is data availability a big challenge while reporting on energy transition in Romania, in Eastern Europe? Uh, it is a big challenge and I want to say that uh, today we mark uh, the 1000th day of the Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine and uh, this is something that completely changed the energy transition landscape in Eastern Europe. Uh, till then we were on a good track with renewables and uh, coal phase out but since then uh, uh, our government, our high-level officials decided that uh, in the name of peace, in the name of energy security in the region, you're allowed to do everything you want. So we're back to fossil fuels. We're uh, proud to announce that we're the biggest uh, natural gas exporter in uh, the EU. We are uh, building two new uh, nuclear reactors and we're uh, pushing the subsidies for uh, uh, fossil fuels while taking them away from uh, renewables. This uh, makes it quite difficult for journalists to report on it because on one hand in Romania uh, the energy sector is uh, uh, a matter of national security so if you try to do investigative journalism on how the contracts are done you, get, uh, you might get in uh, trouble uh, to say the least. On the other hand you have uh, newsrooms with um, uh, quite unprepared uh, editors-in-chief who don't understand uh, much of the energy transition, who don't seem prepared on this matter. You have colleagues who don't understand why you have to spend two weeks in such a conference to get a better picture, to get uh, exclusive uh, interviews. And in the end, uh, they will ask you, when you write about energy transition, you should not use climate change or climate crisis because it will destroy the tension of your article. And if you use it, don't use it at the beginning at least. And don't say that uh, uh, the energy transition transition to renewable sources will reduce uh, emissions and uh, we can save the planet by that. So there is a different, uh, there are a lot of challenges and barriers in uh, uh, reporting on uh, climate change and uh, energy transition in Romania and in Eastern Europe. That is a very interesting observation that a lot of the pushback is coming from within the organizations, within the media organizations. This is quite serious. So let me ask you a, fo a couple of follow-up questions. One is, given this situation, what kind of strategies do you use to, a, number one, improve your understanding of the energy transition, and number two, to improve your reporting of the energy transition? That's my first question. And my second question to you on that is that is, has there been any situation where you have done a story and that has had a good impact? Is there any impact that you can think of? Well, uh, I've got uh, phone calls from uh, Secretary of State asking uh, tell me more about this, uh, put me in contact with this NGO in Germany or some other country I've written about because we want to know more. So they are quite open to this. Uh, on the other hand, I would re uh, recommend the young journalists who are uh, trying their path in this uh, energy sector, which is by far not the easiest one, because if you lack uh, knowledge, it is quite difficult to write an, uh, an article. And if you don't know what you're writing about, be sure that your editor and your readers won't 
neither one day uh, understand anything from your article. So this is the first step. And in order to improve your uh, uh, writing and your skills and your knowledge, uh, my recommendation is to join international networks, organizations who can help you. Uh, firstly, I would recommend uh, the Southeast Europe Media Organization, an organization I'm part of. I'm a board member there for international <laughs> cooperation. Uh, and uh, there we have uh, launched, together with the Central European Initiative, an award for investigative journalism on uh, climate and uh, energy reporting in Southeast uh, Europe. And uh, next week in uh, Montenegro, we it, there will be the award ceremony. And we will have also a panel with uh, winners on uh, reporting on uh, climate and energy issues in uh, Southeast Europe. Secondly, <laughs> for those interested, I would recommend joining the Clean Energy Wire Journalism Network, one of the, I think, one of the best networks uh, globally, because uh, now they have 600 plus uh, members and you can connect with everyone on the globe and report on uh, issues that you can't find locally or even regionally. Last but not least, I would recommend the Earth Journalist Network and thank them for the opportunity to, to be here. And uh, these are the kind of networks uh, you should be part of in order to uh, start your career on an international level and to bring stories which are exclusive for your country. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's not a shame to apply for your uh, international grants to do cross-border reporting on uh, energy topics with other journalists from other countries. You bring your, your know-how, they bring their know-how, and you can good, write good uh, articles and publish them in uh, your language and uh, in the countries where you're from. And I would recommend here uh, Journalist Fund, uh, also uh, where you can apply for grants and uh, there are quite good grants and quite good uh, opportunities there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it sounds good, sounds very good. Let me take the question to you, Chiamaka, on the issue of clean cooking. Uh, now, as we all discussed, <coughs> is a very decentralized thing. Getting data on it is very difficult. So, when you have been doing stories on this, what kind of strategies have, be, have you been using to get over these problems? And, of course, what kind of impacts has your reportage had? Um, I'll begin with the impacts. Uh, like I said in my introduction, <coughs> we currently have a clean cooking policy, which came about after years of emphasizing and re-emphasizing the importance of that. So definitely, that is one of the impacts that I'll say that myself and other energy journalists in Nigeria uh, have seen from you know continuous talking about that issue. So that's one of the impacts. And beyond that, I have also had people, you know, players in the private sector, walk up to me and want to uh, share with me what they're doing. Um, as I speak, the energy sector in Nigeria, or the transition, the, the, the energy transition process is being driven largely by, by the private sector in Nigeria. So we are seeing most of these people wanting to you know, share with us what they're doing. So that, that's one of the impacts that we have been able to have. And beyond that, we also have seen uh, government officials more willing to share uh, the progress that they have made from their end as well. Uh, more government officials wanting to come on television programs sharing their their progress that they have made and also you you did ask about uh, challenges that I'm facing and how I've been able to um, surmount those I'd say just like uh, he mentioned the internet is there I mean we have the internet to get all the information that we we need at, uh, at our fingertips so having access to the internet has been very helpful you know in getting uh, more information for myself and getting more information obviously for my audience and uh, he talked about me uh, joining networks as well so that has been very helpful for, my, for me as a journalist uh, networks like the journalism network is definitely one of those so I'll say, we again, again I'm going to say the internet you know use the internet to get all the information that you need as a journalist and uh, just the way it has helped me I believe that uh, if there's anyone who's willing to grow in that area you definitely you know find all the information that you need online Thank you. Iris, you have a special problem. China has such a huge energy transition program. How do you educate yourself on what's going on? Thanks, Joydeep. I think just like I just said, uh, there's no easy and fast way to cover energy transition. Sometimes you, the only thing you can do is to read and uh, 
until you understand that topic and then you need to ask a lot of questions to different uh, experts and sometimes you need to ask like maybe they have different opinions between each other and uh, yes and don't afraid don't be afraid of asking stupid questions because sometimes the, the the energy transition is very complicated and you need to get through this thing until like until you do until you get your work done yeah and also like also i i think the Chamaka also said find your network because I think currently the uh, climate and energy reporting is doesn't have much uh, attention compared with the politi politics stories and econ economy stories and other stories. And I, I feel like uh, you need to talk to your fellows, to talk to your friends, to talk to, talk to other fellow journalists who cover climate. Like you, ne you need to have a network to not make yourself feel that alone. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. That's very important. And I'm glad to hear about that. Reading, networking, all extremely important. Fermin, I can see that you are going to face very special challenges, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you are training other journalists. Mm -hmm. Because I can, I hope I'm wrong, but there is a possibility that uh, your new, your current government may not like you to talk about fossil fuels. They may not mind talk, you talking about renewable wind and solar power, but uh, they may not want you to talk about fossil fuels. So what kind of strategies are you thinking of to get over that? What kind of impacts have you already had through the stories you have catalyzed? Uh, uh, how how do you see the way forward now? Definitely. So thanks, uh, Shodeep. So definitely agree with, with what my colleagues were saying. Uh, being part of a network, whether it's local, global, regional, that definitely makes a difference. Uh, just to pursue a stories on the ground or or cross border stories. I, I was part of. Uh, uh, story grant with the Clean Energy Wire actually uh, a couple of years back uh, on the role of methane emissions with a colleague from Nigeria and a colleague from the US and we look at the issue kind of with a global perspective and those kind of networks do help especially in difficult times like the ones we are facing now in, in Argentina. Um, being in touch with them, be uh, sharing experiences, uh, telling them what happened, asking for support, uh, that definitely makes a difference. So the the government has quite a, quite an active, uh, we, we could call it an, an army of uh, social media trolls that are chasing reporters, unfortunately. Uh, so you gotta be careful uh, in terms of what you post, in terms of what you share, uh, because the, the repercussions are already visible. Uh, and we, we see that with many, many colleagues. Um, fortunately enough, uh, since they don't care that much about the environment, uh, we kind of, kind of try to lay lay below of their attention. But we'll see how that how that continues. The the government has been quite critical so far on the 2030 agenda and and climate change being a man-made uh, phenomenon. But they they haven't yet quite openly disregarded renewables because I think they they realize that it could be a good business opportunity. They are really pro-market kind of government. So I don't think they will dismiss renewables, but the challenge is that we have two, I guess a couple of barriers that we need, we need them to happen for renewables to scale up. Uh, one of them being finance and one of them being uh, grid expansion. Uh, the grid is completely saturated now. There's no more capacity to install more renewables. Uh, so if the government does want to expand renewables, we need to see a massive investment on the grid and that's really costly and expensive. And I don't see that happening uh, with, the, with the government. And for us reporters, we gotta, we gotta stay safe, we gotta stay focused, uh, we gotta stay connected. 
uh, and rely on each other for support. Uh, it's been a difficult year uh, back home, and it's likely going to be like that for the coming years. Uh, we know what happened in the U.S. We know what happened in Brazil. Uh, so it's it's being being there for other reporters that are facing the same things as you. We are trying to do that. Uh, uh, we are not that many climate energy reporters at home, uh, so we all know each other. Uh, so that makes things easier in a way. Uh, but we try to we try to get to stay connected uh, and be aware of what's going on with someone else uh, and support each other on those difficult moments. Yep. Thanks. Let me take this question to you for me one step beyond what we have just been discussing hmm? i can take on impacts i i didn't get on that <laughs> yeah so let's, let's talk uh, about impacts. Yes. yeah so it's quite common when such as uh, our colleagues were saying when you do a story you get you get a, um, a comment from a government officer or a or researchers as well, academia. Uh, so I, I had many cases in which I've done stories on renewables in which after them uh, I got emails or, or WhatsApp messages from researchers that look at the energy transition in the country and they found the story and they found it interesting. We've, we've done a dialogue earth, we've done uh, maps locating the hydropower and the coal plants in Argentina. Um, they sent me emails after that asking to get access to the database that we use to create that map. Uh, so that's quite common. I don't think that we'll see nowadays, at least from a national level, uh, interest on the stories that we do, uh, but maybe on a subnational level. Uh, while the national level might disregard this agenda, the provinces are quite active, uh, so they do keep an eye and they do want to be engaged with, with reporters uh, quite frequently, so they are a good audience too. That's, that's very encouraging. Yes, uh, we saw that in the US, didn't we? During the first Trump presidency, subnationals engaged in a big way. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sure Argentina will go the same way. But I was, I was also going to ask you about another aspect of renewable energy, which is already playing out in Argentina, especially the Argentina-Chile border region. Uh, because there are, there are criticisms about renewable energy in the area of lithium mining hmm? and that is very big in the Argentina Chile border region how do you handle how do you do stories on that how do you handle that yeah so very good point uh, so uh, for those who are not aware of the area Argentina Bolivia and Chile are part of what's called the lithium triangle that concentrates around 60% of the lithium reserves around the world. Uh, each country has managed the resource differently. Uh, so Chile now is pushing for a strong role of the state as part of the re extraction of the resource and trying to find a way to add value. So one of the things that has happened in Latin America over the years with uh, mineral extraction is that there's no added value. Uh, it's just plain extraction. Uh, so they some of the governments, especially Chile, are trying to change their perspective to try to find some added value uh, on the ground. I mean, some of them are even trying to build a battery, for example, or try to do something, uh, EVs that are done at home. Uh, so Chile has been quite proactive around that. Argentina, on the other hand, is not doing that. They are openly welcoming investors uh, to do really whatever they want, but not adding value. Uh, and they uh, have been quite flexible in terms of social and environmental standards. So the, the places where the lithium mines are located, uh, it's really remote areas uh, where only a few communities live there, uh, but they rely on the scarce water resources that's there uh, because it's uh, really dry places as well. They usually raise uh, uh, cows or some, some cattle in there as well. Uh, and they have been quite, uh, quite out outspoken in terms of lithium. There's been areas in which they have openly resisting lithium mining projects and they've been successful doing that. Uh, the same happens in Chile, the same happens in Bolivia. But there are also communities that have signed agreements with lithium companies in which they have said yes, uh, because they feel that they might get jobs, they might get investments, opportunities. 
So as a reporter, I'm going back to your question, you, you got to be really careful in terms of how you handle that. Uh, communities usually don't get much attention from media outlets, especially mass media outlets. Uh, usually when they report on lithium, it's speaking just the, about the number of uh, the investment that's taking place, whether uh, the scale of the project, the number of shops that it will create, uh, and whether the project is being bought by another company, that kind of thing. But you don't get that many stories on the actual impact of what's going on with the communities on the ground. Uh, so that's usually the case of uh, small, medium scale media outlets that actually go on the ground even and do the stories from there and, and take the communities as the leading voice of the story. I think that's really necessary uh, because they need to be part of the conversation. Um, and really, we are not the ones to judge. I mean, if they, if they feel that the social and environmental standards will be met somehow as part of a lithium project where they live and they want to sign a deal with the community. I mean, that's fine with them. And we, we are the ones reporting. We are not the ones establishing whether it's fine, wrong or, or, or fine. Uh, but I do feel that we need to incorporate them much more on our stories uh, because they are the ones that are facing this, which is a new reality. Uh, we are quite used to gold mining, copper mining, uh, and many other minings that have been going on for, uh, throughout Latin America over the, over the decades. But lithium and all the critical minerals, should I if we actually expand it a little bit more, uh, critical minerals uh, are... Now we are basically facing what some experts are calling a mining boom uh, around Latin America because many of the countries in the region have many of the critical minerals that will be necessary for the energy transition. And we see it all over the region. So how is that being done? It's something that we should be looking for. So how are the projects being met? What kind of standards are our governments following? What kind of standards are the companies following? In many cases, it's just stories that you see in media outlets that report on a new mine, a new development, but not actually stories looking at what's going on with that mine really. I mean, have, has proper procedure being followed? Uh, we even have, a, uh, in Latin America, and I'll finish with this, um, uh, the first Latin America regional environmental treaty, which is called the Escazú Agreement, which uh, a big number of countries of the region have signed, which means first protecting environmental defenders, in many cases these communities. Latin America is a region of the world in which the largest number of environmental defenders get killed every year. Uh, you can see the figures on the global witness reports that gets out usually before COP. Uh, so it's something that keeps happening every year. We're always on top of the list. Uh, so and that's directly linked to extractive industries. And, and also, we need to uh, think of how do we secure information access to these communities on the ground? One of the things that usually happens is that they find out of a project when the project is about to start. Uh, they haven't been part of the conversation with the companies. There wasn't a public hearing. And all that is something that's required for countries to do as part of this, this so-called Escazú agreement. And so following the implementation of that agreement, following how, how is that agreement, agreement being incorporated when a new mine opens up, that's something that we got to be looking in the stories. And I have rarely seen mentions of this agreement in media outlets across the country. Uh, so that's something as well to look at. Thanks. That's very important. Iris, let me take the question to you. There are millions of coal mine workers in China who will be out of a job pretty soon. So what, what are the stories being done on them by the media in China? Where are they going to go? Is the Chinese media looking at them? Uh. Thanks, Joydeep. And uh, I have to say, actually, honestly, I haven't saw like uh, many stories about the uh, co-workers' co jobs, employment after the energy transition. But I think this is a big topic that uh, China, uh, not only government, but also media need to face when talking about just transition. Um, for uh, As far as I know, that uh, some governments will uh, give those uh, coal miners uh, those workers and also some like uh, steel industries workers the, some su subsidy and uh, also to help them to find uh, other jobs but actually when you talk about energy transition everyone will think, think 
will say, oh, those workers will lose their job. But actually, that is not the, the final conclusion because the China has also raised the renewable in investment in a lot of cities, that which will create a lot of new jobs. Uh, I want to um, tell you a story that I, I did uh, before, which is uh, I went to visit a coal mine uh, in a northern Chinese city, and actually, uh, those companies start to do some cre creative uh, works on, in those coal, coal mine company, and uh, they will have like a, you know, in the coal in, in the coal mining plant, there is there is a, there will be a lot of heavy trucks to transport the coals, and so those companies will uh, uh, build will buy some <laughs> EVs like new new energy heavy trucks. To transport the to transport the uh, coals, and uh, some some workers may not know how to drive those things, but uh, the government will give the, will educate them, you know, how to use those things, and the company will also to give some lessons to you know how to drive those things, and but actually uh, actually that it which is more which is better than the traditional heavy trucks because it's safer for those coal miners. You don't need to uh, walk. walk uh, till the mine, you just uh, sit in the sit in the car and uh, transport the car. So actually, I think the whole thing is, is kind of like a dynamics balance. It's not just a uh, uh, lose jobs because the renewable industry or will also uh, create jobs. Like if if we if we always talk about the uh, tr energy transition will make a lot of uh, workers lose their jobs, that which also will create difficulty to to tran to transform to low carbon economy Thanks. Yeah. that's imp uh, I, I think I've made a very important point that when doing these stories we need to put them in context uh, that uh, yes there may be jobs lost here but there will be jobs gained there so what is the retraining going on I think that's very important Chiamaka let me take the same question to you and with the oil workers in Nigeria are, are there reports coming out in the Nigerian media about any retraining plans, what will happen to the oil well workers, who are again a very large number of local workers. Uh, so are you seeing any reports on the just transition in Nigeria? Um, Jaydeep, regarding the oil workers, not so much has been said uh, regarding that specifically, but there has been progress, like I stated before, there has been progress, uh, particularly in the area of clean cooking, like I mentioned, we saw the introduction of a policy, that is the clean cooking policy, which hopes to uh, give about 30 million households access to clean stoves by the year 2030. Uh, that in its own is, ma is major progress, like I rightly stated. But beyond that, we also try to amplify other concerns, such as concerns in the area of deforestation, because according to the Global uh, Forestry Watch, about 1.3 million hectares of land uh, has been lost due to you know, felling of trees for cooking and um, you know, uh, just cooking and bu burning wood, burning uh, wood generally. So that is an area that we focus on as journalists. But beyond that, there has been also you know, concerns around uh, land grabbing by indigenous communities where uh, officials come and you know, make these uh, promises to them. But like I stated, they are not compensated at the end of the day. But then uh, their lands are taken from them and they are left stranded, which has caused uh, distrust, a trust deficit between the government and these people. So those, we try. To, what I try personally to do is humanize my stories beyond reeling out these numbers and you know giving out this data. I try to make it relatable and amplify the concerns of indigenous communities mostly. Uh, sometime last year, I believe it was in the month of May, we saw the introduction or the removal of fuel subsidy uh, by the president who came into power, our current president, and. One year down the line, or one year and some months down the line, we have seen an increase in LPG, that is liquefied petroleum uh, gas, by over 50, by over 100 percent. I remember at the time about 5 kg cylinder of gas used to go for about 3,500 naira, but now it goes for over 8,000 naira, and that goes, you know, raises concerns around the targets and whether or not these targets are actually feasible, thinking about you know, 2030 just being barely a few years away from, from now. And so 
I mean, the, 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 the policy documents are great, but again, the concerns are the implementation. So that is what the media, or myself as a journalist covering that space, tries to hammer on, you know. We have good document papers. Can we start implementing, can we start seeing progress in the areas of implementation? Good point. Very good point. Istvan, you and I have just come out of the press conference about fossil fuel subsidy reforms hmm? and how that plays out in the whole area of energy transition. We all know about the opposition to fossil fuel subsidy reforms, whether it's a farmer in France or the farmer in Netherlands. Uh, uh, and uh, so how is the just transition, which is a concept that, first, that originally started with the coal mines of Silesia, uh, how is that concept playing out in Romania and the rest of the region? That's a very good question, thanks. Uh, it's actually a ridiculous uh, situation because uh, uh, luckily we are part of the European Union and uh, the European Commission transferred us in 2022 just uh, 2.15 billion euros for just uh, just uh, translate uh, transition and uh, we have time till uh, to use the money till 2027 and then to requalify the miners and to uh, get uh, to create new jobs till 2032 and in this context our minister of energy is coming to cop 29 and announcing that uh, after we got the money that uh, the EU policies is an obtuse and uh, losing ideology and while his minister no one will lose his job because priority is defending the existing jobs not creating new ones so um, I'm actually ashamed of his uh, shameless behavior here I think he would have been uh, cheered in the green zone but uh, not here yeah but uh, how are you and other journalists in Romania are doing stories on this? We are doing, actually I've done one uh, while we are here, kind of uh, public shaming, but uh, they are not affected. They are the, there is a lack of trust in media and in journalists in Romania, and there is only a lack of funding. So uh, we're trying actually more to survive, and uh, they know that, and they know how to make uh, pressure on uh, media outlets to avoid uh, critical journalism. But uh, once you're a journalist, you have to do your job, regardless of what happens. Excellent, excellent. And actually, that brings me to the next point that I wanted to ask you about, Istvan. You were talking about how, after the wars in Ukraine started, uh, Romania and other countries forgot all about their move, energy transition and move back, while there are reporters like you, reporters at Clean Energy Wire, who are continuing to push for energy transition, to what extent are you the victims of misinformation, disinformation, and trolling? Well, um, one say you shouldn't read the comments uh, that are after your article is posted on social media. You should focus on your work and uh, what you have to do. But uh, there are uh, trolls who have uh, the same idea and they're promoting it for years. Then the wind farm and solar farms are uh, uh, provoking cancer or killing birds. And uh, we should stop them. And we are losing so much land because of them. And we should invest in uh, forests and uh, uh, do things that uh, could help us uh, better than uh, invest in uh, such uh, uh, projects. But uh, uh, we are trying all the time to speak to scientists, to speak to experts, to have also an expert view on uh, each, this, uh, each story of this kind, to uh, show them that this is scientifically proved and it's not just my opinion or uh, some NGO that is uh, promoting this. Good. Thank you. Chiamaka, how, how bad is the misinformation, disinformation, trolling situation for you in, and other journalists in Nigeria? Uh, Joydeep, I haven't experienced intense trolling in the course of my work, but I have had uh, colleagues who have experienced such. What comes to mind now is a journalist, an energy journalist, who about two months ago we had in Bornu State in Nigeria, a certain dam had burst open, leading to the flooding of the entire state. 
And I recall a certain journalist had come out to write on Twitter saying that this is an effect of climate change. And by the way, as I speak, not everyone agrees that there is a thing such as climate change. And that's where we come in, you know, uh, bursting myths and explaining, trying to ensure that they understand what, what we mean when we talk about uh, climate change. But like I was saying, a, a certain colleague of mine had come out to write that on social media. and She underwent serious trolling on that day. Uh, but again, she took her time to explain on social media to those that were willing to learn. So personally, I haven't experienced that, but I have seen, you know, journalists uh, go through that. But then this is a job that we signed up for and we continue to play our role of, you know, educating, informing the audience on what they may not understand. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that, that's it for me. And moving forward, we continue to do it, I, I, I believe. Good. Yeah. Um, all power to you, Iris. Is misinformation an issue uh, when you're reporting on energy transition? Misinformation. Have you ever been trolled for doing stories on the energy transition? Uh, thanks, Joy Deep. I think there are currently are two major uh, misinformation or disinformation phenomena I faced. The first is just like I said, the energy rep uh, transition reporting involves a lot of expertise knowledge. So sometimes some, uh, like, t for example, the f on the first day, uh, I saw many bloggers on China's social media said the uh, uh, international carbon market is uh, officially launched. But actually, it's not. It's just uh, Article Six. Some uh, make some agreement on that. But uh, there's a uh, tons of articles like that say uh, international carbon market was launched and uh, will will cause uh, some uh, happy emotions, feelings touring some uh, relevant uh, industry companies like that. They thought they think maybe there's a more uh, benefits from it, but actually, it's not. So uh, for this, I think. Just like I said, you need to figure everything out until until you can write this story. And the second thing is, uh, I think energy transition in China is very complex and uh, it's a long-term thing. It's not uh, so. Sometimes I think like I read some media outlets. Uh, they said uh, because China set a goal to achieve carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2060. Um, and uh, maybe like uh, some media said, China this year start investing more in coal project, but actually that's not uh, quite true because uh, sta China's state grid is a big infrastructure, and uh, in the short term it cannot afford uh, a, a large amount of renewable uh, capacity. So if government, if China government. Uh, uh, in, uh, build a, a part of uh, renewable capacity connect to the grid. It also needed to build another part of coal power plant to connect to the grid to adjust the stability of the whole thing. So I think we cannot just uh, 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 judge the short, judge the conclusion from the short-term uh, change. We need to have a long-term perspective. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Farmin. Have you has uh, misinformation? increased with the new government? Has trolling increased? Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, unfortunately, yes. Uh, I'm from different levels and not just on, on renewables, but on climate overall. So it's if you get the message from the head of state saying that climate science is, you know, is uh, climate, climate change is not caused by uh, human activities, then it all goes to complete chaos. Uh, so I had an interview a couple of weeks ago. I was at COP16 uh, as one of the trainers for, with EGN, and I had an interview with the highest ranking environmental official in Argentina. We used to have a ministry. It was downgraded to another secretariat. And we were speaking about many things, and she started speaking about renewables, and she said, well, we got to be very careful on renewables because it's killing a whole bunch of birds. And, and we talked, well, but that's not accurate. There's a whole bunch of studies that say there's more depths uh, over many other energy types compared to, uh, to wind and solar. She said, no, no, I have my own studies. So we started having kind of an argument back and forward with her uh, in the middle of COP. Um, so if that's the person who is in charge of environmental policy, and if she believes that, then, well, we got a problem. Because if she's passing on those kind of messages, uh, it's very problematic. And we see the same thing 
uh, on other sectors as well rel related to climate action, uh, especially on the cattle industry, which is massive, as you may know, in, in most of South America. Um, there was a, a case study a couple of years back when there, a paper came out uh, that included, among other researchers, one researcher that was participating in a program of NASA. Um, the paper looked at the emissions of the cattle industry but not including methane and as we know methane is the main source of emissions from from cattle and that paper led to the cattle lobby associations in Argentina and in Paraguay to release press releases saying that beef from most of the South American countries was carbon neutral uh, so every mass media outlet uh, in both countries picked that press release and just copy pasted it and the news got out saying well we got carbon neutral beef, uh, we are fantastic and, and a couple of reporters including myself actually reached out to the scientists and told him hey there's a couple of media outlets here saying that based on your study we can say that beef is carbon neutral, the guy was completely angry and we ended up uh, publishing a few stories on a few fact-checking websites uh, but that kind of narrative is coming quite strongly from the cattle industry back home uh, so and now as Jody was saying with the new government when we have people in power who are openly questioning climate science it's highly going to escalate I mean that, that's something we are already seeing and probably is gonna keep up on the years to come yeah well we have to keep fighting right uh Time to turn it over to you. I know you have been a very attentive audience. Uh, uh, so, uh, who wants to go first uh, with questions? Do I see hands? Right, okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, please wait for the mic. Please identify yourself for the sake of the recording and, and say who you are addressing the question to. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Alexander and I work for uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, the largest newspaper in uh, Poland. And um, in terms of threats to journalism, uh, I just want to add one more thing that we suffered the most in Poland uh, while we had the uh, far-right government for last eight years. It was uh, more of a uh, legal harassment towards journalism. So I myself was uh, a, a target of a uh, of a slap uh, by a state-owned company and I won the case uh, in a court uh, actually for a lot of money uh, to, to win this case and um, so my question is uh, if you suffered the same in your countries if even a case and uh, uh, what is your like prognosis for the future especially uh, this question goes to Furman thanks so yeah, uh, that, thanks for sharing uh, that by the way. Uh, I'm sorry you had to go through uh, that. Um, so I know many reporters that have been taken to court by the government in Argentina, uh, suing reporters because of the stories that they did. In many cases, asking them to disclose their sources when the stories were off the record. Uh, reporters usually win uh, those cases, uh, but it takes time, it takes money. Uh, not every reporter has the legal support from the news outlet that they work with. Uh, I'm imagining that was the case with you probably, but it's usually tricky. You need to rely on independent organizations that might have your back, uh, such as news, or, uh, news associations, uh, net networks, that kind of thing. Uh, but that has been happening more over the past year with the new administration. Uh, I, it hasn't happened to me personally, but I know uh, really close colleagues that have to go through that. And uh, it's terrible uh, because it, it goes against even the laws that you have in your country that should secure uh, the freedom of reporters to work for. And the government is openly challenging that. Uh, every day we see the government kind of picking uh, on a specific reporter and openly trashing him in social media. Uh, that really happens quite frequently, weekly or daily. Uh, and it's terrible because it, uh, it's kind of, they throw a whole army against the reporter uh, that then may escalate to a legal case. Uh, so you gotta be extremely careful, be being well advised, uh, being part of networks, as we said. But that's the reality that we face with this kind of governments, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, 
EJN, by the way, let me tell you, uh, is an organization that wants to hear from reporters as and when they face. We cannot promise that we will help, but we will definitely try. Mm. So, yes, if we know that such cases are happening, reach out to law your lawyers, reach out to your media organization, also reach out to us. Do that. Any other question? Yeah, oh, sure. I'm Mugesh Bukit uh, from Nepal. Uh, I'm a fellow of the EGN 2021. Just uh, uh, in Nepal, due to flood and drought, many hydropowers are uh, impacting. Uh, so I want to know uh, what is your, uh, what is situation in your country, uh, especially China? There are uh, many uh, hydropower sons. So the specific question was uh, due to hydropower, uh, due to floods and droughts, what's happening to hydropower projects in China? I think, I think this year, especially in summer, China experienced a lot of uh, floods, and uh, I think, according to reports, there may be more than uh, 20 times. But uh, according to the announcement and uh, some Chinese media reports, I haven't seen any uh, accident happened to those hydropower stations. Uh, but but one thing interesting, I think, because of those. Uh, uh, floods and uh, rainfall and uh, to will make the ma make some China some uh, hydropower uh, station have m can generate more electricity like in some thousand in some uh, China some thousand cities those uh, they have more hydropower stations which will uh, during the rainfall season they can generate more uh, electricity so that uh, those uh, cities can can use less uh, gas. Uh, ga uh, gas power uh, electricity. So actually, f uh, from what I know, actually it's, it's like the the good inside the good benefits is more uh, when you talk in talking to hydropower station. Yeah. And yeah, I see a hand at the back. Can you please pass the mic back? not on now it's on uh, namaste everyone this is roshni adhikari from nepal uh, my question is like you all can address it because when we are talking about the environment when we are talking about the clean energy or whether we are talking about the uh, energy transition is it is very vast like uh, for you who is continuously doing reporting still uh, you are saying there is a uh, information disinformation uh, uh, confusion between the uh, reality and the fact. So uh, in Nepal, like I served as a president uh, for Nepal Forum of Environmental Journalists. We have that in Nepal. And we did uh, lots of trainings all over the country. So it is so hard to bring the journalists in one platform and really uh, orient them in the diverse uh, areas of the environment. And reaching to this point is very far away. Like I'm not talking uh, for the central Kathmandu, not for the capital. Maybe in capital we have some, like Mukeshi and like several number is here. But uh, if I talk about the like uh, lots of floods and droughts are happening all over the country. Nepal is facing very uh, hard time this uh, this year. But it's very hard for us. So. Uh, what is the condition in your country and what is your suggestion like how can we you know move forward from the very beginning thank okay. you so much okay chiamaka would you like to take this i mean specifically that part of the question what is the level of interest that you see from small town reporters in nigeria in environment reporting in general and reporting the energy transition in particular Jaydeep, uh, I can relate to what she said, especially, you know, talking about flooding and uh, droughts. It's something that is also occurring in Nigeria, where I come from. So I can relate with that. And talking about small town reporters, uh, thank God, or we are grateful, you know, for something 
called citizens uh, journalism, even beyond having that formal training that you need to be a journalist. These days we have people sending stories uh, via social media to report what's happening in their local communities. So we definitely have, you know, s uh, local or small town journalists uh, tell their stories with what's going on with them. You know, how it's how, say, flooding is affecting agriculture and food production, which, by the way, has been a major concern as well. Uh, for Nigeria this year. We have seen drastic drop in our levels of food production. So we have segments on our program, or where I work, on a, on a program that I anchor, where we have people you know, sending uh, visuals as to what's really going on with them. So there has been heightened uh, journalism across rural areas uh, currently. And uh, I believe that is a way that we get to hear firsthand and get situation reports and what's really going on. So I believe that answers it. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I'm so glad you are doing that. But I do actually I want to ask, put the same question to Istvan as, he, uh, as the member of the board of the Southeastern Europe Journalist Forum. Uh, how, if, what are you doing, if you're doing anything, to spread good reportage, especially in the area of energy transition, in very small towns, even villages, in your region in southeastern Europe. A few years ago, uh, when we launched the initiative to uh, offer an award for uh, climate and energy journalists in southeast Europe, we got like uh, two or three uh, applications. But today we got we are this year we got already 30, so there is an increase of uh, journalists interested in this topic, and uh, I mean, journalists understand that they have to report on issues that matter. Everyone at home is interested. Will my electricity bill increase or decrease? This is something that matters for everyone. I've met people, ordinary people who look to be like experts in energy. They know when to use the energy, when not to use it, if it's okay to wash my uh, clothes uh, in this time of the evening or not. So we, don't un we shouldn't underestimate our readers because uh, and it makes sense to report on these topics. And we are trying to fund young journalists, we are trying to encourage them to uh, choose this path and we are hoping that the level of media literacy will increase and uh, they will be appreciated as they should, especially in this region. I'm so glad to hear you say that. It's exactly what we're trying to do at the Earth Journalism Network at the, and the Stanley Center. Any other question from anyone? Hmm? If not, I can see that we have run over time. Uh, I thank all of you for being such an engaged audience. Nobody moved a muscle. And that is something. I'm so glad to see that. You are all most welcome to join us for a networking reception over here. Th thanks especially to all our panelists, to all my colleagues. Thanks a lot. Let's have a party.